So one of the main reasons that I wanted to write this book was that I really believe that we're at this sort of watershed moment, a moment when data information is radically switching from being a scarce commodity and top-down to ubiquitous and bottom-up. Um, and how our new tools of gathering and sharing information are changing um, how we see ourselves and the world around us. And as Julie alluded to, this is a sort of ongoing fascination of mine. And in particular, I believe that the digital data that we're generating about our everyday lives can and will be used to change the real flesh and blood, bricks and mortar world around us. And this is both good, thrilling even, I argue, but it's also potentially very scary, and there's some really worrisome aspects to this as well. And I think in order for us to get the future that we want, people like us, citizens, but also people like us in particular who are in the business of communication, need to get involved. We need to claim our power to use uh, our data for good, for positive ends. And we need to be, more than that, we need to be data activists, much in the way that we might talk about people being political activists or environmental activists. We need to be activists with respect to this new world of booming data. Because what we as a society decide are the rules of the game for handling the data we create is going to shape the future in profound ways. It'll shape uh, whether and how we can use the data in our own lives, how we can use the information we create to benefit not just ourselves, but our own communities. And what we're seeing now in embryonic form in our use of you know, apps and social networking and so forth is really just the beginning of this bottom-up data revolution, which I think is going to shape the next 20 years or so. And I think it's easy for us to be cynical about shaping our technologies and being those data activists when we're in a world with very powerful companies with millions and millions of users like Facebook or Google. But here's the thing, it's precisely when a new communications technology is created that the culture and the social norms of that technology are open to being shaped. It's at that beginning period that we can bring our consciousness and our skill to how we consider new technologies and improve what they're used for. Because down the road, there's going to be a point where all this stuff starts to seem inevitable, where what's up for grabs right now gets shut down. So this is the point at which we need to start talking about these things. And so take, for example, the history of uh, the telephone, something that seems now as obvious and natural to us as breathing. But there was a time when you had to teach people about the phone. So here, if I can get this to work, is a public service announcement from um, the early days of the phone, right when you first had to um, could direct dial instead of going through the operator. So this is a public service announcement that came out around that time. Before calling any number, first secure the number from your new directory. Then remove the receiver and listen for the dial tone. It sounds like this. <laughs> You think you got that? <laughs> um, so, you know, that's a perfect case, right? It's a phone. Like, what do you have? What is there to talk about? It's a phone. But people actually had this conversation because it was this very new thing. And similarly, in the early days of the phone, people had this kind of discussion about what to say when you pick the thing up. Because it's not obvious if you've only written letters or sent a telegram or whatever. And they actually had discussions about, you know, some people wanted to say, what is wanted? Uh, and there was a big push for a while to say, ahoy. And then finally, people settled in English, at least, on hello. Although, I think I could make a compelling case for ahoy in this day and age, really. <laughs> so the reason why I use that sort of um, simple example of the phone is that uh, that's what I'm arguing, is that we're at that point with respect to these new technologies, at that ahoy, hello moment, right? Where things are in play, where we can still discuss before it becomes obvious and kind of immutable that you should say ahoy as a hello instead of ahoy. Um, and so that's what I'm arguing. So first of all, I want to get a little bit more with definitions and talk about this idea of the digital data that we're generating about our everyday lives and what I mean by that. And I'd like to start with a simple example um, by talking about a productivity tool I came across while I was working on the book that I use from time to time. Now, I may be going out on a limb here, but I'm guessing there are some people who use productivity tools in their own life, right? <laughs> Online calendars, little tips, things to track yourself. Who uses them? Lots of people here, I'm sure. Yeah, okay, <laughs> I figured. Um, so I'm sure a lot of you do, and um, 
but I wanted to, to talk about one that I use because I think I may be able to trump you in your use of productivity tools. I use this tool called Rescue Time for a little while. And what Rescue Time is, is it's a little piece of uh, free software, uh, also could be called a torture device, uh, that you put onto your computer and then you tell your computer what are the productive and unproductive uh, activities you do uh, during your workday. So your email, your word processing, your spreadsheets, your PerezHilton.com, all that kind of stuff that you do. Um, and it even sort of asks you when you've been away from your computer for a little while. So if you go and make a cup of coffee and you come back, it says, Nora, you've been away for the last four minutes and 16 seconds. What have you been doing? <laughs> so you go through this and it just essentially runs in the background. You don't have to really pay very much attention to it. And at the end of every week, it sends you this helpful little email that breaks down exactly how you've been spending your time. Uh, and as you can imagine, I'm sure a lot of you write for your job, so, and I use this while I was writing the book, which is essentially an entire exercise in procrastination. So getting this thing every week was, it did make me more efficient, although I have to say it was in equal measure, um, you know, helpful and humiliating. But the thing is, when I saw Rescue Time, which came with this incredibly complex breakdown of metrics, the kind of thing that, you know, a short time ago, a major corporation would have spent a lot of money trying to get these kind of metrics about how people were using their time. And now it's this free thing that you put on your computer. It's trivial to put it on your computer and have it run. And when I saw this, I knew I'd seen the future because rescue time is one example of a much larger trend which is growing as we head into the future. And that's a future where as individuals we track where we're going, what we're doing, how we spend our time. And for the purposes of the book, I really didn't want to talk about oversharing. So this is not about confessional culture. Um, this is about what you could call the statistical minutiae of everyday life, such as how much time you spend on PerezHilton.com versus on email. Uh, I call it self-tracking, but other observers have called it self-monitoring, personal metrics, the quantified self, or um, what was the one I heard today? Personal informatics. That was one that I heard, which is a great phrase. So if you don't engage in self-tracking, you might not be aware of how much it's actually growing as a trend. So let me sketch out for you a couple of examples. And this is a big okay. one, is tracking your body's performance. So you probably already know somebody who's a runner who tracks their runs on their uh, Nike Plus system or their Adidas My Coach, or people who wear a little Fitbit that tracks you know, how they're moving their bodies and so forth. Um, people use the Zio, which is a hugely popular um, tool for tracking your sleep habits. Um, or it could be any one of the endless uh, websites and apps for tracking things like calorie consumption and so forth. So there are lots of these things, but you could even extend it to something like um, check-ins on Foursquare, right? That whole idea of just tracking where you are physically and what you are doing with your body. So that's one huge layer that we're seeing. Another aspect that we're seeing a lot of is um, tools to document your reactions to the world. So this is where you have these digital tools that are kind of an inter interface between you and how you're behaving in everyday life. We all know, I think all of us probably are um, prone to taking tons of photographs with our cell phone cameras about everything that we see around us. Um, but this could also be something like, like this, like Yelp, uh, documenting what the Pilot Tavern is like, tracking your reactions to what you experience around you, tracking things like TV shows, like books you read with something like Get Glue, all those kinds of things. We register our responses to the movies we see on Netflix, not necessarily because we have this burning desire to self-track, but because it's the kind of thing that helps us get better uh, movie recommendations on Netflix. And then there's the kind of inadvertent tracking that goes on simply in virtue of using digital tools like Rescue Time, because this is the nature of digital tools, right? They know how they're being used. I don't have to continually keep going to Rescue Time and tell it what I'm doing. It just ticks, ticks, ticks along in the background and records it. And so basically, if you can think of something that people are tracking, they're tracking it. Um, you, I'm sure some of you know people who do this, and perhaps you're even in the room. The taking pictures of what I ate people. Do you have any taking pictures of what I ate people here? This is huge, right? Okay, somebody's copying to it. Congratulations. <laughs> so this is this huge trend, right? And I'm not talking about people taking pictures of this incredible meal they had at El Bulli or something like that. It's just taking pictures of everyday stuff that they're, um, that they're eating before they um, sit down to their meal. And that could be something that they keep in their Tumblr or that they share on Instagram. This is one of many um, group uh, Flickr 
pools called I Ate This. This particular one has, at the time I did this screen capture, it had 26,000 members approximately and nearly half a million photographs. And you can see they're not like that. There's toast there, right, in the corner, right? <laughs> it's not. This is, this is, and this is exactly what I mean about why this stuff is actually uh, peculiar and yet ultimately quite interesting because it's not actually in the oversharing. It's in the, the everyday, in some ways the banal, the ordinary, and so forth, that this phenomenon becomes quite interesting. And why do we do this? Why do people take pictures of, of their toast? Partly because it's easy. Right? It's simple matter, it's trivial. You're just there, you've got your camera, it's with you. It's very easy to even you know, location stamp it so you know where you were when you had the toast and to share it with other people around you. And I admit this does seem potentially a little bit uh, quirky, but it is becoming uh, more and more a mainstream activity. And even things that you, know, you might think that people would be hesitant to do in a way other than sort of under lock and key in a very kind of private way uh, are becoming hugely popular. Tons of people use Mint, which is a budgeting and personal finance site. I'm here seeing some people nod their heads. The last time I checked that had over six million users and that's something that requires you to share, not with other people, but with the service itself, some pretty in, you know, intimate information about your banking behavior and so forth. And if this seems like a surprising thing to do or um, you know, a bit on the fringes, consider the fact that most Canadians who are online are on Facebook, right? And that a short several years ago, this was something that people talked about when Facebook first came to Canada, people talked about it as odd, you know, why would you want to share the minutiae of your everyday life, say what you had for lunch with people. Uh, and now this is something that is normal behavior with most, Canadi with most Canadians who are on the internet, not because they're obsessives, not because they're, at least not for the most part, narcissistic, but because there's a social utility into gathering that information and sharing it, right? And I think for a lot of us, when Facebook came out with its timeline feature, suddenly what things that seemed like this very ephemeral sharing of information suddenly started to look like, whoa, there is a very large corpus of data there about um, you know, where I'm going, what I'm doing, the pictures of me at the beach, my status updates, and so forth. Uh, from Gizmodo, uh, photo libraries of what I'm talking about here. So that square is all of the photographs that are on Facebook. And the kind of little square in the bottom left-hand corner is Flickr. And then that tiny, tiny little square at the very bottom left-hand bit, that little tiny bit, those are the photographs in the Library of Congress. <laughs> so this is a you know, really clear illustration of that. What I'm talking about is that difference between the scarce curated top-down and the voluminous bottom-up character of this auto-reportage, this self-generated data. And so in the book, I talk quite a bit about the historical and psychological factors behind self-tracking. But tonight I'd actually like to talk about some of the bigger picture implications of this documenting and sharing and how that information might actually be used beyond taking pictures of your toast, not that there's anything wrong with that, um, to actually reshape the communities that we live in. And so to or in order to understand that, we need to understand the differences that the affordances of digital technology makes. Because we're using increasingly digital tools like computers and portable tools like smartphones uh, and tablets that we have with us all the time, we don't really need to work very hard to capture this kind of information, right? Unlike older analog technologies like paper, um, because the computer or these digital tools know how they're being used, this kind of information can, I think, and will in the future be more automatically captured. So your e-reader, for instance, might know in quotation marks when you last read and where you left off reading, not because it particularly wants to surveil you, but simply because in order to work and return you to where you left off, it needs to keep track of that information. This is just in the character of digital technology. And of course, there's this other thing about digital technology, which is that it makes it easy to share this information with other people and to move it from one context and put it into another. No surprise here, this is why we love social media so much, right? Because it's good for sharing, it's good for taking things from one context and putting them into another. So 10 or 20 years ago, it was technically possible for me to keep a little booklet on my bedside table where I would write down 
you know, the length of time that I spent reading every night and how many pages I read and how quickly I progressed through the book and all that kind of stuff. But then what am I, what am I going to do with that information? I could stand out on Cumberland with photocopies of that and hand it out to random people, but I'm not very likely to be very successful with that, right? It's when we're using the digital tools that do this automatic capturing and sharing that suddenly it becomes useful information because I'm not just handing it out to random people, I'm handing it out to people um, who I may have something in common with and suddenly the fact that I read this book and I read it very quickly right to the end or this book I didn't finish reading at all, that suddenly becomes useful information when you have a community of people who share the kinds of interests uh, with you. Again, nothing particularly unusual about this. This is what we love about social media. Uh, and of course, you know, the nature of those shared connections have a big impact on the value of that data. And this is one of the things that we need to consider as we think about the usefulness of all this bottom-up generated data that we're creating. So for instance, um, this is a, a Twitter this is, this is a capture that uh, a Twitter user did after uh, the 100th anniversary of the sinking of the Titanic um, in April. And this is a group of people who didn't realize the Titanic was real. They thought it was just a movie by James Cameron, right? So there's Charlotte saying, is it bad that I didn't know the Titanic was real? Yeah, Charlotte, it kind of is. <laughs> But so this is, not to make fun of poor Charlotte, but this is the kind of thing that we're going to have to think about as we start to create all these tools for gathering and sharing this information, is how can we design the tools so that we can get and share good information with, the, with other people? And so granting this caveat about the quality of the data, which I'm going to come to, back to later, here's where all this starts to be about more than just an odd preoccupation uh, or something you might think of as at least trivial because it actually turns out not just like beyond sharing with a community of like-minded people once you can aggregate that information about what people are doing where they're going what their moods are and so forth you can start to learn some very interesting things about the world around us and so what I'd like to do now is sketch out what the Toronto of the future, uh, the city of the future, might look like as a result of all this self-tracking and sharing. Stick picture of what that might look like before we get down to some thorny questions, because you knew there'd be thorny questions. Um, because ultimately, whether you decide yourself to do the self-tracking, it's I really believe it's going to have a huge impact on the shape of our communities, much in the way that we can look back at the last 10 years of social media as being disruptive and revolutionary in so many industries. So let me offer a simple example of what I mean by how this could be used to shape communities that actually exist in the real world right now. So who uses a GPS navigation tool in their car? The kind that says turn right in 25 meters, lots of people. Um, and uh, so the way that works obviously is that there's a relationship between the satellites and the GPS unit that allows, uh, allows um, the GPS system to be aware of like, okay, now it's in this geographical location, now it's in this geographical location, now it's in this geographical location. And it turns out that when you do that kind of tracking, again, not through any sort of intention to, to self-track, but just in order to work, it needs to keep track of this kind of stuff. That'll give you a pretty good idea of how quickly the vehicle is moving, right? Because you know what, how long it's taken for, for it to go from here to here to here. And once you know that, you have a pretty good idea, rough and ready idea, of how quickly traffic is moving. And so with Google's GPS system, if you say so, anonymously, that information can be shared and it can help make for smarter traffic maps. And so you can see, I took this capture uh, early this morning, which is why it looks like there isn't a lot of traffic. So what, what Google Live Maps does is it takes that information and it gives you a live map and where the map is red is where there's a lot of traffic, where it's green is where there's smooth sailing, where it's amber is somewhere in between. And because, and it does that partly based on just sort of statistical norms of how quickly traffic is typically moving, but it also augments that with this kind of live information about how people are traveling through the city. And so you can imagine, so that in itself is useful, but you can imagine the kind of further use that you can get by this, right? So you're using your uh, Google Navigator system. You're telling it how quickly you're moving, which is creating these live uh, traffic maps. And then as you're in your car, you're looking at your map and saying, oh, you know, Bay Street is red. I'm not going to go on Bay Street. I'm going to take this other route. And then that information in turn is fed back to the live 
traffic loop, which then turns up on your map, which then allows you to recalibrate where you go, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so what that means is that we're essentially creating this kind of really powerful dynamic feedback loop between your behavior in the real bricks and mortar world and what the uh, online tools show you, and then that again being fed back and fed back and fed back. So this is a really powerful kind of loop going back and forth between the digital and the real, and it's constantly updated and so forth. And so what I'm suggesting is that this kind of tool, which we see in a sort of embryonic form with, uh, with something like Google Navigator, is the kind of vision that we can imagine for the city of the future as we start creating more and more of these kinds of loops. And as we essentially have, because we're using more digital tools rather than analog tools, this kind of digital layer that exists between us and the bricks and mortar, flesh and blood world around us. And I'm not talking about some kind of scare, harebrained scheme that, uh, that I have. It's not even my idea. This is stuff that's actively being pursued um, at the research level. So MIT, for instance, has a whole research lab that I actually visited over the course of the book, very cool, called the Sensible City Lab, which is premised exactly on this idea of how we can improve the performance of a city to make it more sustainable, more responsive to how it's actually being used if we can have access to this kind of information. So if we know what people are doing, where they're going, how they're behaving, how they're using the city around them, we can start to make the city more responsive to the needs of the people who live there. And obviously we don't want to know, you know um, what Nora Young is doing, uh, but we want to know where people in the aggregate uh, are and what they're doing. So consider the, the humble cell phone in this respect, how much information it contains about where you go. Even if you don't use a smartphone, even a regular old phone has this kind of ability to sort of know where it is because it needs to do that in order to, uh, to function, to triangulate to the nearest uh, cell phone towers. And this kind of simple data about where phones are, therefore where people are, is being used for all kinds of uh, novel purposes and not always in the developed world either. Um, because remember that most of the world's cell phones are in the developing world and not the developed world. So I came across two while I was researching the book. Um, one is cell phone data, again anonymous, being used to plan the location of um, latrines and slums in Rwanda or to deliver malaria medication um, in Kenya. So the actual value of some of these tools may be precisely in, in areas of the developing world where they don't necessarily have access to all that um, sort of more formal data um, such as census data and, and formal addresses and so forth. And so that kind of thing, this sort of um, Google Maps thing and, and the cell phone data, is what's available just kind of from the digital trails that we happen to leave behind in virtue of using tools. But if the community can be improved by access to this kind of passive data, think of all the information we could be contributing to our communities if we choose what we want to report on. And again, here's where this idea of being a data activist, of actually making a choice to use this, not just for a sort of personal self-tracking, but actually to make our communities better and smarter can actually be powerful. And so again, let me give you an example from the world right now and we can extrapolate to the future. Uh, has anyone here heard, heard of Ushahidi? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, so Ushahidi is Kenyan technology that arose after the post-election violence several years ago there. And what it allows people to do, it's open source technology, it allows people to send a text message. Initially the idea was to report on um, episodes of violence that they were seeing around them, which then got mapped uh, on an online map. And so the idea was partly just to sort of bear witness and also partly to hopefully track where the violence was heading to. Uh, and it was very successful. And so it's been used, because it's open source, it's been used in a lot of different contexts around the world. It's been used um, to monitor uh, election irregularities in India. It's been used in the United States in an election context. It was used after um, the crisis in Haiti. This is an example of when it was used right after the earthquake and tsunami in uh, Japan, where people used it as a tool to report on, sort of on the ground observation about um, things like lack of access to water or collapsed buildings, all the sort of crisis stuff that was unfolding. And um, so it's, it's of a piece with the same kind of self-tracking that we're seeing going on in other areas, right? There's not fundamentally a difference between tracking what you're seeing around you if it's your toast or tracking what you're seeing around you if it's an unfolding crisis situation on the ground. 
but the purpose, the values that underlie it, and the uses that it can be put to are obviously uh, more profound. In terms of making these communities that know how they're being used is the extent to which we're starting to have sensors dispersed in our environment that can detect things, so air quality, public transit, you name it. We're already seeing this in Toronto in an embryonic form where the TTC had this project for a while uh, where at some bus and streetcar stops you could see constantly updated information um, posted about where your streetcar was and that's because the vehicles know again where they are and can communicate that information so you always have always have last minute updates about the fact that your streetcar is late <laughs> so, so when all these pieces come together self-tracking is this burgeoning cultural phenomenon the ability to aggregate the data, sensors in the environment, and continual access to information through our mobile technologies like our phones, we suddenly have this very different information ecosystem, right? It's highly dynamic, highly responsive, and very much bottom up. I think of it as a data map, this fluid, public, increasingly location-based set of information, a digital doppelganger, if you will, of the real world around us. And we're only at the beginning uh, as the real world around us starts to have this kind of digital layer. So I hope that I've given you some sense of why I find this stuff potentially so exciting. The power for personal insight, but also for bottom-up collaboration on building information systems that are immediate and responsive is compelling and powerful. But there are questions that we have to investigate, right? So first of all, obviously privacy. Anytime we're dealing with the digital, we always have to consider Privacy And right now, privacy is governed mostly by the terms of service agreements that we click I agree to without even reading. Um, so we need to make sure that the data is properly anonymized. And partly that's digital and media literacy, but there are more problems in that. And this gets back to the affordances of digital technology, right? The way digital technology is good at taking material from one context and putting it into another. And that means that information that in one context can be completely innocuous, in another context can be not so innocuous. So some of you may remember the um, little flurry of um, writing that went on about the Girls Around Me app that came out maybe two or three months ago, remember this? So this was an app that was designed for um, Foursquare, a third-party app. And the premise was that it took two different sets of publicly available data, each on their own pretty innocuous. On the one hand, um, four square check-ins to bars that pe where people had left their privacy settings completely open so anyone could see. And the other one, um, Facebook information that also was similarly open. So on their own, not particularly weird or over -sherry, but when put together, suddenly you have an app that can tell you, here's this woman, she's at this bar right now, this is what she looks like. This is her relationship status. This is where she went to school. These are her interests. These are her favorite movies, et cetera, et cetera, right? And it starts to look kind of creepy. So that's an example of exactly what I think we haven't quite wrestled with, right, is not just the oversharing, but the strange ways that this data can be recombined um, in ways that we perhaps don't envision them happening. I should say that. Um, Foursquare did uh, uh, get rid of the uh, Girls Around Me third party app after that. So there's that, and then there's what about the kinds of things that we choose to monitor? I mean, if there's so much potential for us in the use of these, this data, you know, we ought to open this kind of stuff up and seize the creative potential of that. I mean, Ushahidi was not some kind of like giant IBM sponsored huge project, right? This is the beautiful disruptive power of the internet. It's just a small group of people who had a really good idea to make these lightweight tools that would be easy and helpful for people to share information. And it's not that I have any problem with um, people having sound business uh, models for what they're doing or making money. It's just that surrendering the data only for those purposes seems like losing sight of a huge opportunity to take advantage of that. You know, companies and researchers and others are already starting to look at this kind of information for insight. You can think about something like um, sentiment analysis of Twitter or whatever. But we, of course, have to consider when is it statistically reliable? When is it about what more than a small number of technically savvy people are doing and starting to be more about what people are doing? Um, what are the potentials and pitfalls of this information? When do we need an extra layer of intelligence? Interestingly, Ushahidi, Although they've continued to use this very um, robust, fantastic tool, they've also launched another tool called Swift River, which adds another layer of sort of 
um, supervision almost on top of it uh, through a combination of algorithms and human oversight to try and increase the um, the reliability of the information and I think we're going to start to see lots more experimentation with how to make these tools really reliable. And another question is really when we think about designing software and hardware and services that allow for this kind of data capture, are we thinking about the values that underpin that? I mean, are we designing the tools so that they support those values? I mean, take the obvious example of Twitter. It's become an important tool for information gathering and dissemination, but the very simple fact that for whatever reason in the early going, it was designed so that you can follow someone without their having to follow you back, that little design decision had a huge impact on the ability um, to share information widely without people needing to have enormous numbers of social connections to make that happen. That's a little design decision that reinforces values. And as we go forward and design these kind of tools, we need to think about what are the values that we want to support in the design of our very tools. And finally, I think when we think of ourselves as people in the field of communication, whether that's journalism or marketing or PR or tech design or whatever, there's this question that we need to wrestle with, which is how we create tools and services that actually offer people utility and the ability to create meaning in their own lives. Because there are going to be tons and tons as we go forward into this future of free apps and tools that are popping up to take advantage uh, of this new propensity to collect and share data. Tons of apps that people are going to use two or three times before they lose interest in. And so the real question is how we're going to create value and meaning in those spaces and give people the tools to create their own meaning and do so in a way that respects users' data. And I, I really believe that we're at that kind of ahoy or hello moment and there's tremendous potential for us to shape the way these tools develop, um, to start thinking of ourselves as data activists and that for people who are involved in communication or people who are technologists in any area to start thinking and talking about this because it's important and I look forward to seeing how you bring your skill and energy to the challenge. Thanks so much.